So hi everyone, welcome to breakout session B, value-based philanthropy, stewarding gifts with integrity. My name is Miao and I use she and her pronouns. I am a member of the scholars leadership team and I will be acting as the moderator for this session. So I would like to start off with a land acknowledgement. We at the Banya Center acknowledge that the land on which we operate and which is named for the Ute tribe is traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshu, and Ute tribes. We recognize and respect the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. Additionally, I would like to go over some community agreements before I introduce our speakers for today. Um, so you must speak in I statements, engage in contribute fully and genuinely, be purposeful and to the point, be um, conscious of sharing airtime with other participants, lead with compassion and respect, and last, create an inclusive environment when everyone can drive. And as a quick reminder, this session will be recorded and uploaded to the banyancenter.org slash conference. If you are the under age of 18, please turn off your camera and provide only your first name. Otherwise, feel free to have your camera turned on or off during the rest of the session. All right, we are joined today by Ted Jackson. Um, Ted is a senior corporate relations and philanthropy manager with the American Cancer Society where he cultivates relationships with local businesses, foundations, and individual donors. Prior to joining the ACS team in June, Ted worked as a senior corporate engagement advisor with the United Way of Salt Lake. Ted is a 2017 graduate of the BYU MPA program and received his bachelor in economics from BYU in 2015. Ted is also a transplant from Northern Virginia and enjoys exploring the nature of Utah, baking, and traffic. And now I will turn my time over to Ted. Thanks, Miao. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, our lovely small little group here. Uh, as Miao said, my name is Ted Jackson. I use he, they pronouns. I've um, been at American Cancer Society since June and um, have really enjoyed my time there. Um, and I've sort of been working in this philanthropy gifts donor space um, for the last four years collectively with United Way Experience. Um, and so today, uh, we'll just be spending a, a little bit of time with a smaller group. I, I don't think we'll need the whole hour, but we'll see. Um, talking about what it's like um, to work in that space and what happens when you encounter um, stewarding a gift that poses an ethical dilemma. So that's something that I think would be useful to talk about today. But before we dive into that, since it is sort of a small group, um, I think it'd be great to go around and uh, get to know a little bit about everyone. Um, so if it's okay, um, to go around and just say your name and I guess your major, what brought you to this session in particular, that would be helpful to me um, as I go through this. So Courtney, you're the first person on my screen all the way to the left. So if you wanna go first, that would be great. Yeah, I'm Courtney um, and I am the staff partner at the Binion Center, I work with the community partnerships. Um, and I was interested in this one mostly because I know Ted and we've worked together previously, um, but I think it's a really interesting topic to think about what does, we live in a certain system and so we do have to accept money, but how can we do that in a more ethical way and what does that mean? So uh, yeah, really interesting questions, I think. But, um, Josh, do you want to go next? My name is Josh. I am studying Spanish and community engagement at the U and I was interested in this session uh, because I'm interested in philanthropy. So I'm interested in learning like the social impact world of what that's actually like giving on a, a larger scale. Great, um, Robert, yeah. Yeah, um, my name is Robert. Um, I am a fourth year biochem student. Um, and I don't know, this, this breakout session kind of caught my attention. Um, uh, it's, I think it's just really important that um, when people give their gifts, it's, it's good that we allocate those funds correctly um, and, again, with integrity. And I don't know how to do that. So, um, yeah, I thought that it was really interesting. So, Good to have you. And Meow. 
<laughs> Hi, I already introduced myself. I'll go again. Um, I'm in a third year pharmacy student over at the University of Utah College of Pharmacy. And I actually chose the sessions because I mostly did a little bit of philanthropy, not much so. And I was really intri intrigued um, by it. You know, it was from the American Cancer Society. So that caught my eyes as I was you know, mostly interested in like medicine and see how they did it on their end. So I was mostly interested in like what resources that you do, how you support these communities and all the partnership you work with. <laughs> That's very helpful for me to know. And I do think, luckily, I think we'll cover everything everyone indicated as they're interested in. So with that, I will start um, sharing some slides here. Uh, great. So we're gonna start with, um, with a dilemma here. So this is near a dilemma I've been in myself before. So um, Josh, do you mind reading it for everyone? Yeah, dilemma. You work for an organization that supports refugees and immigrants. A private prison company wants to donate to a campaign to build your next education center. The company recently put in a bid to open its first prison in your state which will quickly become the primary detention center for illegal immigrants according to the current administration's immigration policies. Do you accept the company's gift? Um, so this is near a dilemma I've been in before. And so I, I don't know if I wanna keep this anonymous and do a poll or if we wanna discuss this, probably start by having an anonymous poll, Courtney, if that's possible. Um, I just wanna poll the group based off of just what's on the screen right now, would you accept this gift given this context? So yeah, one second. <laughs> okay. So, Yeah. Okay, could we have more than one person <laughs> complete the poll? Okay, great. Yeah, so there's not a lot of us, but um, yeah, so, so far 100% have said no. Um, so I'm gonna end it. And I guess, I guess share results, but you get it. 100% um, said no. So, uh why why would that be a questionable gift does anyone want to willingly come off you who answered no and say and and say why they chose that okay uh so we are going to revisit this dilemma later in the presentation and have more of an opportunity to talk about it in length uh I'm not gonna say right now whether or not that's the best thing to do. In that case, I think it is, um, but we'll come back to that um, a little bit later. So in my experience, I think as with donors and gifts, uh, I think it's more of a matter of when and not if uh, you will be encountering a questionable gift. Um, the world is pretty broad and there's a lot of people who, who view philanthropy in a lot of different ways. And so you as the executive director or maybe as an employee uh, or even as the person donating uh, may come across these sorts of dilemmas, these sorts of questions as you're attempting to do good in the world and your intent is good. Uh, a lot of a lot of questions exist about what is the impact of that gift and how do, how do you as an organization or you as a person uh, approach that gift with that in mind. So generally when we think about ethical dilemmas, so if you, so it sounds like a few of you are already aware of what these types of ethical dilemmas could be. Uh, the one I just shared would be that third one that sort of quote unquote tainted money or uh, values violations. Uh, the question being, does this undermine our mission if we accept this gift or if we partner with this individual or have this person on our board? Uh, it brings up this question of, would this undermine our underlying values and mission? Uh, there are others, of course, conflicts of interest. Um, you've probably heard of this before. 
is someone benefiting unfairly? If we accept this gift, is are we accepting a gift because someone here at the organization works or is married to or is affiliated with someone at this organization and we are receiving this gift in some sort of conflict of interest? Uh, there are ways um, to declare those and to work around that, but that's generally a dilemma in and of itself. And then there's accountability and stewardship. And so I think Robert, you mentioned this one. Uh, it's that concept of are we as an organization reporting back the truth of how we spent this person's dollar um, or these person's dollars, um, speaking broadly to any donor who donates? Are we truly being transparent about how we are spending and allocating these funds that we're receiving um, in, in the light that we advertise we'd spend them in? So for the sake of time, I didn't think I would cover all of these. I thought I would focus on this third one, um, which I've had more experience with, which is this tainted many values violations. So that's where that first dilemma came from. Generally, um, as we think about these types of gifts and wondering how do we accept them? Why would we accept them? Why would we not? Uh, not to be too simplistic, but I think it comes down to considering at least these three questions, which is, does this gift support our mission? Does this gift violate our values as an organization? And thirdly, does this violate my values as an individual? You are an individual working at an organization, or maybe you are the individual running that organization. And sometimes, yes, you represent the organization. Um, all the time, you represent yourself. And so I think it's important to, uh, to apply what we're talking about today to your own values and your own value structure, which I'm not going to offer any instruction exactly as to what you should do there, but I think that should be part of your process as you're evaluating gifts that are coming in. So with that, we're going to come to um, that scenario again. We're going to dive in a little bit deeper and walk through those three questions together as a group. So coming back to it, uh, setting the stage, we work for a nonprofit. It provides resources to immigrants and refugees. Uh, I just made up this mission statement. Uh, Courtney, can you read the mission statement for us? Yeah, uh, empower our neighbors through connection, compassion, and community resources. Beautiful, alliterative mission. Uh, simple as you will find at most organizations, right? Like a simple one sentence, this is what we're here to do. Um, pull out some heartstrings, but also tell you what we're here to do. Um, so we're not going to break out since there's only five of us, but what I think having a broad mission statement does is it leaves a lot of space uh, for interpretation, which in some cases is really great because you get to expand your mission over the years, you get to grow, um, reinterpret it. However, I think it also provides opportunities when faced with ethical dilemmas to need to put more on paper as far as what you are and are not willing to be as an organization. So as a group, I think it would be great if we could discuss what does it mean to empower our neighbors through connection, compassion, and community resources. As a group, can we come up with three to five values? So examples of values would be something like, um, I think at IRC, one of their values is our priority is empowering women and children. So your value is whatever we do, we're prioritizing the well-being of women and children. Uh, maybe a value is sometimes they reduce these down to one word and it's like respect. What does respect mean? Well, we, I don't know, we offer respect to anyone who comes through our doors or um, we steward gifts uh, from community leaders or we prioritize uh, leadership by immigrants and refugees being supported by our organization. Those are examples of values. I don't know how to sum all those down to a single word. So does anyone want to come off mute and put forth another value that they think this organization would have? Uh, one that comes to mind that I do see a lot of other organizations use, but it's like collaboration. So I feel like connection and community resources require a lot of collaboration. So mm -hmm. that one. I'm going to write that down. I 
I want at least three. So we need two more values put forth. Um, I think just looking at, especially like the word compassion, um, I think there needs to be an individual care for um, the neighbors or just like, I guess more care for the individual over, um, I think just a situation or something like that. So compassion is our value. And we determine that as, uh, explain that a little bit more, Robert. So prioritizing the, the individual over what? Yeah, well, um, I just, uh, just valuing, I guess, the individual through compassion. Great. We'll go with that. Okay, thanks for letting me pry. I know we're coming up with these on the spot. Yeah. But I just wanted to make sure I understood what you were saying. Uh, great, so collaboration, compassion. I will put forth a third one, which is trust. A lot of groups put that forth as, as this way to imply that whatever we do, we're going to steward it transparently. So we're gonna put that forth as a value. Okay, so we have our three. So collaboration, trust, compassion. Those are our values as an organization with name X. Um, and our mission is to empower our neighbors through connection, compassion, community resources. Great. So let's come back to the dilemma at the beginning. Um, so Josh already read it. Um, so to answer this question of, do we accept this company's gift? A lot of you could sense already that this had some questions to it. Let's think about why um, first and foremost. And I also want us to talk through what are some ways that we can I guess, formulate or um, put in a system or structure within the organization to come to that answer quickly and so that everyone is on board. So how does this gift support or violate our organizational values? So given our values of collaboration, trust, and compassion, does anyone want to come off mute and say, why would accepting a gift from a private prison company in this scenario support or violate those values? I would say it violates it looking at the organizational values of collaboration and compassion. I feel like with those two, we would want to be helping regardless of, in this case, the, the person's citizenship status, be it that they're a refugee or um, an immigrant. So we're wanting to help them regardless of that. Whereas with the gift, it's directly, in a sense, attacking those that mm -hmm immigrants so you're saying if we accept a gift from a private prison company that although not the administration itself but would be part of i guess detaining individuals in that scenario individuals we claim to help that brings up an ethical dilemma that you say that would violate our value of collaboration yeah uh anyone else um there were at least two people who answered the poll. So is there anyone else who wants to say why? Um, I'll just offer, I think there's always the interesting question of you can't achieve your mission or values without funding. And I think that's what a lot of nonprofits, or at least how I've experienced this discussion in the past, it's like, well, we can't do any of these things if we don't have the money to do it. And so if we have the money, why not kind of? I think for myself, I don't agree with that, but I know I've heard that argument from people. Yeah, that's a common perception within the nonprofit space. It's that we are essentially money launderers. We'll take money from anywhere. And as long as we're spending it on the thing that we promised to spend it on, which is this sort of good intent gift, then does it matter where those funds came from? And I think we've been able to identify that like, well, kind of, it actually does in a way violate our values as an organization. That if we accept gift from someone who outside of handing us this gift spends the rest of their time supporting everything we're working against is that gift uh is this does this transaction mean more than just accepting those dollars um and that is why coming up with the values 
list is important. And I think a lot of missions, though vague for good reasons, again, we have a lot of space to say, you know, can what gifts can and can we not accept and why and why? Um, so coming back to this dilemma, it personally, I think this would violate the values that we came up with, right? Just like Josh said, just like Courtney said, it would violate this concept of collaboration, which though we sort of defined here very quickly in just 30 seconds is like, no, we wanna collaborate with partners, our community. Um, we were able to decide for ourselves that does not include members of our community who want to in the rest of their time and with the rest of their money undermine our mission um, and harm this group that we're attempting to help. Um, moving on from that, so a few ways um, so Miao, you asked, what does it look like at an ACS or what does it look like at other nonprofits when given these types of dilemmas, how do they approach it? There's a couple of ways. Um, so one would be having a gift acceptance policy set in stone. So as an organization, you can, for example, say whenever we're presented with an, uh, something that smells ethically like a dilemma, uh, we will assemble a dedicated executive committee on our board, um, given that that board has no conflicts of interest within this particular ethical dilemma itself, um, to assess whether or not um, that gift is truly fitting or undermining our values. So some questions that committee might address would be, for example, the one that we just asked ourselves, does this compromise our values as, a, as an organization? Um, is there compatibility between what the donor wants and what we are planning to do with it? Uh, will this damage any of our public relationships? Um, and will the gift primarily benefit the beneficiaries or is this gift more benefiting the donor and their PR? Um, and will this discourage future gifts? So those are some examples, took those from the Nonprofit Risk Management Center um, and they have several examples of these um, that you can go look at. Um, but those would be examples of how a small committee like that might come together and, and, you know, we might kick it up the chain to them to say, is this gift ethically okay? Uh, well, we've done it ACS, so I can't use the one that we use internally, but um, I, I know for a fact that ACS will never partner with a tobacco company for obvious cancer reasons. Uh, we would never partner with them on any of the things listed here. So we would never do cause marketing with them. We would never do sponsorships with them. We would just simply across the board say no to everything. So our made up refugee immigrant organization might do the same with political, political organizations. I'm not saying that has to be the case. I'm saying that might be the case. Uh, we might come up with a matrix and say, given any future gifts, we will always come back to this matrix and this is our guiding star. And it says, is that gift coming from a political organization? Don't you dare touch it. Um, this serves to set that in stone so that everyone at the organization is on the same page um, from volunteers all the way up through the board chair to, uh, to operate on the same level of understanding. Uh, you might also on the same matrix say, well, what about a health insurance company? If we work to help refugees and immigrants, do we work with health insurance companies? You might decide that depends. It depends on the organization. It depends on these questions that we have to answer as a board committee and um, whether or not we want to accept a strategic alliance, for example, where I've got the question marks or an in-kind gift. We, those might be questionable, whereas others are a complete no and others are a total yes. So this is one example of how you might set in stone that gift acceptance policy so that everyone at the organization might be on the same page. Are there any questions? I've sort of stormed through a lot about gift acceptance policies, about these matrices. Are there any questions about how a nonprofit might operationalize these sorts of guiding stars? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. I, I, it seems that these gift acceptance policies are more based for like larger donations. Is there anything like in place for like the, the, the single donor, you know, like the average person that just wants to contribute? 
you know, uh, a few yeah. bucks here and there a month. I've seen it less for uh, individuals. In fact, I've found a lot of nonprofit organizations say, you know, we'll accept dollars from most individuals because we're not appealing to the company. They might separate that, for example, and say, we will not accept a corporate match from that company on an individual's gift, but we'll accept that individual's gift. Uh, of course, with anything, I think there's exceptions and I think there's there should be good reasons for those exceptions. Um, I think, you know, an organization that supports Im immigrants and refugees and says we will never accept from someone who has a certain affiliation with supremacist groups, then that would be a very good policy to have. How do you operationalize that? I don't, I honestly don't know um, because sometimes you receive gifts anonymously. So what I'm saying is that could get complicated, not impossible. Um, and I think for that reason alone, I see it far less just because nonprofits are less aware of where gifts come from sometimes. Um, where it comes from a foundation or a major gift individual where they're giving tens of thousands of dollars, obviously there's gonna be more of a spotlight on that publicly. Those funds are going to be possibly more restricted. Um, so they may, may want to dedicate those to a specific program or capital campaign. That might be where we see more of this coming into play, right? Where it's, well, if you're gonna to donate to our building to support refugees and immigrants, we don't really want your name on that building. So we don't really want to accept your gift at all. So I see that far more common. Other questions up until this point? I'm curious, have you ever seen like an anonymous gift from a foundation? Can you do, and then how would you think about that in this matrix? I don't think I've ever seen in a completely anonymous gift. I think I, I've seen checks come in with no <laughs> no direction um, and that just requires reaching out to that organization and trying to track it down as best as possible or else leaving it unrestricted which I think is is fair so Courtney is your question if if a check flies in from that we never reach out to this organization they sent one in because they heard about us and it's questionable is that your question Maybe. Yeah, I'm thinking about like we would receive money for like a specific project and that person did not want to be recognized or connected to that money at all. So maybe that's a different question, but it's not necessarily anonymous, but they don't want any public recognition. Is that one of the types of giving? Or how? Yeah. Does that make more sense? Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand. Okay. I think so I'm just curious so say like a tobacco company was donating to our fake nonprofit, but they were donating and they said like we don't want any recognition we don't want anyone to know that we like donated this money oh, We'd like to I be see. represented as an anonymous donor of x amount of money I'm curious how that how you think about that when they're not looking for publicity they're not looking for like public recognition but they are providing dollars still so if nobody ever knew is it still wrong to accept a gift from a questionable partner? Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, and again, I think that's something that as an organization working through these questions, that's something to discuss and decide. And that that's a really good point, Courtney, which is uh, I think I've heard of companies that say, well, if we're not recognizing them publicly then and the gift is unrestricted, then we're comfortable with that level of anonymity and that level of money laundering. We're okay accepting a gift from a questionable partner because their name will not be attached to the gift. I think that's a little short-sighted. I think there's always a way. I, I mean, it's not like nonprofits don't publish 990s. It's not like no one will ever find out. I just think it's, it's possible. Uh, so I don't know. To me, I think it's impossible to just accept it completely anonymously ever. That being said, I think there could be, uh, depending on your organization, depending on your values, your mission, there could be a subset of partners that you say it would be questionable for us to have a strategic alliance that's very public with this partner. However, if they want to provide a corporate match during their campaign, we don't see that as a conflict. We see that as just something that they provide us each year. I think it's possible. I think it's it depends. 
Yeah, unfortunately, my answer to a lot of these is it depends because it really does. Okay. So uh, this is a new dilemma. Um, uh, Meow, do you mind reading this one? Absolutely. Um, so a board member would like her company to contribute to your initiative to promote cancer screenings among LGBTQ teens. Employees of the company will be invited to donate and the company will match their donations. You recently learned that the company's health insurance policy does not cover comprehensive health care for employees or children of employees who are transitioning. Do you accept the company's gift? So given everything we've discussed, Courtney, if we could put up another poll, um, what would be initial thoughts on this one as well? I'm curious to know. So if one person chimed in, I'd love to hear from the other two, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, okay. Pulling the poll. Um, so the so one person pulled in is no. I think this is a scenario I made up. I don't know if I've seen this yet. Um, well, I've seen both these things, but not in the same scenario. Um, so we're not going to discuss this one as a group, but I just want to bring it up again as as another example. As there could be people who, depending on the mission, depending on the values, might interpret this as not that bad. There might be others who say absolutely not. Um, and so I think this, I show this example this as a little bit more of a gray area um, when it comes to these sorts of dilemmas. And again, it truly comes down to taking a broad mission or a broad value statement and being willing to put to paper uh, what your do's and don'ts are um, and sharing that among the organization so that you're all on the same page. So, uh, are there any questions? Anything else that we can discuss as a group with the time that we have left? I think we have about 15 minutes or so, um, or a little bit more than that, but happy to answer any other questions or just talk through anything else. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. What, what is it like from a competitive standpoint? Uh, I'm sure that like the foundation you're working for isn't the only foundation working to end cancer, for example, sure. right? Yeah. So how, how is it from that aspect having to deal with all these other organizations that are likely trying to do similar things? In in what aspect? Like in, as far as fundraising goes? Or? Yeah, fundraising operation, just in general, like impact measurement. Yeah. Uh, speaking for my job in particular, um, it all comes down to highlighting what we do that other groups don't. And at the same time, highlighting how we do partner with those other groups to show that we are working together. So, uh, well, yeah, I want less specific examples, but uh, for example, American Cancer Society operates the Hope Lodge. Um, if you've seen it or passed by it, um, which houses cancer patients as they come in for um, treatment, sometimes for a week, sometimes several weeks, um, depending on how long that treatment is. Um, so that's something that we do that no other group does here locally. So that's something that we prioritize a lot in our messaging. Um, and a lot of it is just figuring out, uh, you know, where we might focus spending on research. That's another thing we do at ACS. We, our sweet spot is uh, funding early stage research. So folks who have recently finished their programs, looking to open their first lab, that's where we like to focus our research funds. Um, so it would be prioritizing those here in the state. I don't, I honestly don't know what other groups um, focus on that same category of individuals and researchers. So that's my long way of saying, finding what your value add is as an organization, uh, highlighting that, and then 
starting with whoever you know who is already giving. So in our case, it would be our board or uh, folks who have contributed during our events or have given funding for research, working with them and their networks to see who else might be interested in, in what we do specifically, um, and then going from there. So, so I guess, yeah, competition, I don't think we try to phrase it that way at all. I think we try to help people see that like we do something completely different. And so this is our value add in all the services that are being provided to cancer patients. This is what we do. So if you're interested in providing the full picture, we think that's great. We're part of that. I have a question around your last example. Yeah. Um, so for that, that seems like something you could potentially go to the company and say like our healthcare policy isn't, you know, is not comprehensive, right? It's not covering um, trans folks. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it seems a little more flexible, I guess, in some ways. Um, so I'm curious how you think about some of these dilemmas and instead of a yes or no, maybe it's like, can we work to change something about the dilemma to make it within our values? Um, and if yeah. you have, yeah, do you have like experience about that or how do you think about that kind of maybe area? Yes, so I have had that experience before where we were approached with um, a gift that was, that presented a dilemma. Um, and so our course of action um, along with our board and committee on the board was, why don't we approach this partner with just being transparent about the fact that this is bringing up an ethical dilemma for us among our staff, among our organization, it's possibly undermining our values. So let's be transparent with this partner um, rather than just coldly saying no. Yep, so we did that. Um, and that could, it did not lead anywhere, but that could definitely lead somewhere where just like in this last dilemma, maybe that's something good that the company should be called out on or not called in on, I guess I should say, um, and say, we'd love to discuss with you as an organization how this is undermining our values and how with this gift, we'd love to negotiate. Um, and if you're able to provide this type of healthcare service in the next six to 12 months, um, you know, we'd love to accept this gift at that time. I think there are a lot of options, a lot of gray. Um, again, that would be something that I think could be worked into a gift acceptance policy, right? And say, when presented with, with a questionable gift, we will run it through this process. And that would be one of our courses of action is discussing this with them. I think that's totally an option. Any other questions? Yeah, one more. Uh, sure. When you're when the American Cancer Society is presented with a donation, be it the small funds, large funds, how is it generally decided where those funds will be will be used? So we give the donor the opportunity to restrict that gift, right? So if you as a donor say, "I only want to give to research," then that will go. There are a couple of different places, either nationally um, or locally. So that'll either go to funding local research or national research. Let's say you want to donate to just events, you get your pick of events um, and or you can leave it unrestricted within events. So we like to provide a lot of different options where there's no option indicated, but the opportunity to do so is presented, then it's a considered an unrestricted gift um, by and large. Um, and so that will go that's a great question. I don't know exactly how that's determined at a national level, but I'm sure it's sort of a filling the buckets mentality where it's, well, we'll fill this bucket for research until that gets full and then we'll move on to the next one or maybe we'll do them all at the same time. I honestly don't know how that gets worked out financially, but if it's unrestricted, that's what I'm saying. The organization has the freedom to determine where it goes and when. So in a theoretical case, if, if lots of people were choosing to go to like research or events and you were um, underfunded in one aspect, mm. what, what would typically happen in a case like that? Or how would you imagine somebody would approach that? So they would tell me to start looking for donors who'd be willing to give unrestricted gifts to support our unrestricted activities. Yeah. So in those scenarios, they might have me go back to some of those partners and say, hey, I know that you wanted to give this gift on." restricted 
to this event, would you consider giving half of it to this other thing? It actually, yeah, it actually requires us going back to them and asking because we can't just do that on our own. But yeah, it would be seeking out unrestricted gifts at that point. And then what would the, the cost ratio be of like overhead of like actually running the organization versus like the money you have put towards events, research, you know, whatever else is going on in the organization besides just keeping the organization afloat? I don't know what our overhead rate is at ACS actually. Um, and I could also spend 30 minutes discussing admin costs and, um, and how one should think about those as they think about an organization. Um, so I'm gonna answer that by not answering it because I don't actually know what our overhead rate is. Um, but if that's important to a donor, then I'm sure that that's something I can look up and provide. It's just not on the top of my head. Yeah, yeah I think that's a good question though. And thinking about how it does take people to run an organization, but often donors don't want to give unrestricted funds because they don't necessarily value the people that actually implement programs. They just want to give like programmatic dollars. Um, and so, yeah, I think maybe to what Ted was alluding oh, to. I see. Yeah, but, and so the operations cost can be hard to fund sometimes, but also like you're never gonna do anything if you don't have people to achieve your mission. So yes, I think there's a, some big contradictions in how folks think about donating around that. Yeah, and I, I worked in places before where we specifically stewarded uh, overhead gifts, right? And so we, we said, instead of saying this is unrestricted, we're restricting it to overhead gifts. Um, and sometimes that works. Sometimes there are groups that like, yep, fully understand that, happy to support it, um, willing to come in and be a partner there. Um, and yeah, I, I guess I suppose if it is unrest unrestricted, then it could go to those admin costs. Like Courtney said, I think that it's important to recognize that if we want talented people to run this organization, that's it's required that those people are paid well as well. Um, I think I've lost sight of your initial question, but I think it was. No, that's right. That's right along the, okay. the of what it is. It was just like that kind of balance of, uh, Courtney explained it really well of Great. understanding there's admin costs and there's impact costs to put it that way, program costs. And so it's just getting that balance with, with funding. So, yeah. Yeah. That's and that's why we provide the option to the donor. It's like, if you don't want it to be, if you don't want it to go to admin costs, we understand, restrict your gift then. And so I think that option's always there. Any other questions? I can think of one more. <laughs> yeah, go for it, Josh. <laughs> uh, in regards to, to recruitment, how does like your um, salary, like benefits of working at your organization, I'm not saying you have to disclose your personal, but in general compared to other people with that similar backgrounds, so like for example, you said you have an MPA. For other people that have MPAs in other fields that are perhaps like a public field rather than a nonprofit. How does that work with recruiting people? So, so I don't like think- you I... find, Do you find it more difficult to recruit people into the nonprofit with perhaps mm. like benefits, like compensation wise or? Um, so I've not been on the recruiting side. So everything I, so my only experience has been as an applicant. <laughs> um, and I guess my personal experience has been uh, the nonprofit space, depending on the organization, is, is not as attuned to um, sort of formal internship or, um, I guess, educating programs. And so by and large, a lot more for-profit companies have like an internship program, sort of a track, um, a professional development program for its employees, given that it's employing a lot of people has a lot of resources for training. Uh, my personal experience has been a lot of nonprofits don't have that or are new to that or are finally doing that. And so hiring someone who doesn't have a lot of nonprofit experience seems to be a little bit more of a risk for a nonprofit organization that doesn't have a lot of, a lot of dollars to spend in the first place and wants to hire um, talent that could come in and do a job or five. And 
uh, know what they're doing without a lot of training in advance. So I would say that that's a pretty uh, general nonprofit experience. Of course, not every case. Larger ones like ACS or United Way even that are uh, more national uh, do tend to have national resources um, to put towards things like training, um, often then approaching it from that national perspective. And so I think the chances of hiring fresh talent is uh, are higher with, with those organizations that are a little bit more um, have been around for a longer time and are quite a bit larger. Um, but I do think recruiting, yeah, if you're, if you're hoping to work for an organization that's already small, has a small presence, hasn't been around for a long time, uh, relationships are important. I think being able to demonstrate through whatever work you've done already, how you're a great fit for that role is the best thing. Um, but I think just having a degree or just having an MPA or something is not doesn't do the same amount of work as it would, I, I think, in like the for-profit space. But that's just, again, my perspective as someone who's applied to jobs. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, Courtney, I think that's all I have to say about, about the session. Um, if we're able to give a few minutes back to everyone. Oh, yeah, I think, Meow, you have a couple wrap-up announcements. Oh. And then... ah, okay, um, so thank you so much for participating in the session. And a special thanks to you, Ted, for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. In addition to conclude this meeting, there will be a survey sent out shortly after the conference, and we will gladly appreciate your feedback on it. So that way we can make the conference even better next year. And so if you can fill out those surveys for us, that'd be great. And otherwise, I believe everyone's is welcome to leave. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Take you. Care.